Hi, hi everyone. Thanks for joining us today uh, for this Lunchtime Artist Spotlight and Art Making Session. I'm Linda Swenson, the Assistant Manager for Studio Programs at SAM. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on Indigenous land and that the Seattle Art Museum is located on the ancestral land of the Coast Salish people. I'm excited to be introducing our artist today, Kristen Ramirez. Uh, Kristen is an artist who works across artistic disciplines. She has trained as a teacher and, and taught high school for a little while before heading to University of Washington for an MFA in printmaking. She often works as a public artist, and you may have seen some of her work across the regional landscape. Uh, while her work draws on a range of her artistic forebearers like Anne Truitt, Frank Stella, and Kenneth Noland, who all use the hard edge painting style that Kristen favors and are all in Sam's current show, City of Tomorrow, uh, which is unfortunately currently closed, but we hope you'll be able to visit the exhibition later when we're able to reopen. Kristen also references uh, poets and writers and is always thinking about community voices and clear messaging using language and letters as both form and structure in her work. Kristen will speak uh, right now for about 30 minutes and then we'll move into the making portion. So feel free to um, put questions in the question box and at the end we'll come to um, be able to answer some of your questions. Welcome Kristen. Thank you, Linda. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Seattle Art Museum. It's a great privilege to be an artist and uh, it's a great privilege to be seen by the SAM in this way. Um, to be in some small part of the legacy of Virginia Wright is really an honor. So I'm really happy to be here right now. And uh, we're gonna start by showing a video that was created by a very remarkable uh, photographer here in Seattle named James Harnois. And I recently completed an uh, artist residency and a mural commission for Amazon. Maybe you've heard of them. And uh, James made uh, this time-lapse video of that mural and there's uh, an interview there too. So we're gonna look at that video and then I'll go into showing slides of my work. I am Kristen Ramirez. I am an artist. I am a studio artist. I'm a public artist. I make a variety of things. I am also a mom and that greatly informs my art practice. I started out uh, in printmaking and came to full-time art making a little bit late in life. So I didn't really give myself permission, I guess you could say, to, to really pursue art until I was about 30 years old. And prior to that, had uh, worked in, as a high school teacher in education and arts education in San Francisco in the Bay Area. That's where I'm from originally. I was really interested in printmaking as a democratic medium insofar as you are not making one thing but making multiple things so I wanted to figure out how I could take these prints and create like an installation with them. I was very interested in from my San Francisco days I think in sort of wheat pasting and postering and again like the, the democratic nature of printmaking like getting a message out to the streets to the people. And so slowly evolved over time to, to use my printmaking techniques and ways of working into larger gestures and in particular murals. This Amazon residency has been truly remarkable. To have space and time and resources to make work, it just was such a gift to be able to play, experiment. I went through old journals and notebooks and sketchbooks before I got here and made a list of things that I've been interested in doing for upwards of a decade. It's just been a great gift to me. I've loved every minute of it. So my time here at Amazon began in late July of 2020. And as I think we all remember, the summer of 2020 has been so dynamic and painful and evocative and on everyone's mind was this racial reckoning we're in, how we heal our country, how we become a less divided nation and come together as, as people. So I did what I do, I suppose, and I made a painting. And I made a painting on an abandoned building across the street from where I live. And it was the Muhammad Ali poem, very, the very simple poem, the me, we poem. Turning on its head this notion of me, of our individualistic society, of us taking care of our needs first, and what we need to do to change that. And that is simply turning that into a we, into the greater uh, 
good, the social contract, and taking care of our set, like us all together. It felt like the right message for this time to create a mural that is at once site-specific, that responds to that lobby, to the height of the wall, all the things I like to do with color and vibrancy and create movement and a composition with the powerful words of Muhammad Ali, something that could be worthy of the greatness of Muhammad Ali. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and uh, walk through a lot of um, images of my work and kind of try to try to tell the story of what I do. Um, so let's see. Okay, Linda, can you give me a thumbs up? Do you see? Yeah. Okay, great. All right. So um, I'm Kristen Ramirez. Thank you for having me today. Um, studio and public artist. I'm going to start by saying that for me, uh, being an artist is not one thing. And I talk a lot about being a mom. And I think uh, being a mom for me is the most important thing I do. It's the thing I take the most joy from. It also um, constructs my life in a certain way where I have to juggle and cobble things together in a way to be the most present and available and loving to my son that I can be. So I have constructed an art career based on all these different ways of working. Um, I am a studio artist, I'm a public artist, I do letterpress, printmaking, I do design work, I do curatorial work from time to time. I'm an arts administrator and I've been doing arts administration um, on almost full-time for the last five plus years, but for 20 years before that, I made my living as a teacher and teaching artist. And so that's deep in who I am also. Um, so you'll see that throughout these images. Oops, trying to advance, there we go. All right, so I'm starting by showing some studio work and I'm going back in time, like way back in time. This first image is quite old, maybe 13, 14 years old. I was living in Ballard at the time. I still felt kind of new to Seattle. And I was interested in, I was making a lot of works on paper and I was interested in conveying a sense of place, how our identities get wrapped up in place. And also kind of quietly noting how fast our city was changing. And so talking about nostalgia for old places, which ends up being you know, about gentrification and displacement. So with a camera, I was with, uh, photographing things in my neighborhood in Ballard that were kind of old timey and spoke of commerce. And you'll see throughout my work that I like using text and I like conveying uh, like symbols and signs of commerce um, throughout my work. So fast forward to just a couple years ago, this is another work on paper. My color palette hasn't changed that much. Um, the way I work hasn't changed that much when I'm doing these kind of works on paper. So I'm using ink, I'm using gouache, I'm using watercolor. Um, but for this project, I made a suite of images and I was thinking about the US-Mexico border and this idea that the border crossed us, that so much of what is now the United States had been uh, the territory of Mexico up until the Mexican-American War. I, in my own personal life, am in an ongoing exploration of what it means to be um, mostly Irish, but also Mexican. My grandfather came from Durango, Mexico. I spent a lot of time in Mexico. I speak Spanish. I grew up in a bicultural way. Uh, for a very white presenting girl, that, that's interesting. Um, but anyhow, I, I think you'll see Mexico throughout my work because it's, it's deeply in there. Um, so here I'm portraying the sort of mashup of businesses on both sides of the, of the US-Mexico border in the cities of Ciudad Juarez and El Paso, Texas. And uh, there are a couple more of these that I did also. And then here are some um, just discrete works on paper, three of them. And this was a series of five that I did. And so I've been collecting for some time um, aerial photographs of land. And I was interested in how they kind of became their own modernist abstractions, like geometric abstractions, and then wanted to do something with them. So I created these five works on paper. They, from left to right, the pattern behind is, look, is showing you um, agriculture, farmlands, and then the picture on the far right is actually an image of the port of Tacoma 
And then I love integrating text into what I do. So I've been collecting these sort of quips and quotes and things from journals and things that I've been reading, um, particularly about climate change. So this is part of a exhibition I had at Four Culture a couple of years ago now uh, called Mapping and Mocking the Anthropocene. And so the whole show was kind of looking at uh, the human hand in the landscape and how radically our world is changing and how much it freaks me out. So that's what these three pieces are about. Uh, and again, just to show the kind of range of how I work, I can't really ever settle on one material. So for that show, I produced a lot of silk screen prints, had all these leftover scraps on the floor of my studio and was like, well, I can't throw these away and thought about um, just for fun, kind of creating this quilted kind of landscape with paper. So using quilt and tiling patterns, uh, cut the paper and literally taped it all together to create this um, quilted landscape. Part of that same show, uh, I had these painted sandwich boards. And so I like to dabble in sculptural gestures too, even though I've never been trained in sculpture, but it's fun to do kind of low stakes things that I know aren't gonna hurt me or other people. <laughs> so I created these A-frames. Um, like I mentioned, I like kind of turning in symbols and uh, forms from, from commerce, from advertising on their head. And so in the case of these, again, I was thinking about climate change and kind of the range of emotions that I feel on any given day. Like, are we gonna be okay? Maybe. Or, you know, when it's super smoky in the month of September in Seattle, every day I feel like, oh no. Or, you know, perhaps sure, we can, we can engineer our ways out of this. I, I'm not sure. So that's what this work is about. Uh, and then, You'll see I've been continuing to play with this form, but I, I love the architectural form of the billboard. Um, I'm also, you know, grossed out by how inundated our environment is with advertising. Uh, so I thought to create a mini miniature billboard using just balsa wood, glue, illustration board. I'm cutting out type letters with um, an illustration board, exacto knife. So simple tools like that to create what I've affectionately called low stakes architecture because again it doesn't have to really <laughs> withstand gravity so much very lightweight um and in this case the ter the words everything must go um they continue to be poignant and resonant for me but it was a title of an article i read also about climate change like if we're really going to change this we have to change everything about the way we live so yeah you know kind of a dark message um, then i'm going to go back in time a little bit to this image uh this is showing work that i created uh, for Edmonds Community College. I had a solo exhibition some years ago in their gallery and I had been doing some teaching there. And part of the charge was to also work with students while I was getting ready for the show. So I did a number of uh, classes with Edmonds Community College students and taught them how to silkscreen print. The title of this show was Lore. And so I was interested in knowledge and wisdom that we glean from families, from our elders, from our aunties and grandparents and parents. And so I interviewed these students um, who represented such a range of cultures and languages. So there's some of these posters are in Tagalog and Spanish and other languages. And they shared with me things that their elders or had used to say to them. And then I worked with a metal a guy who works with metal to create the lighting component because I wasn't sure how to do that. Um, but it's sort of a twist on the idea of blood is thicker than water, um, the, the importance of family. So that's what this show is about. So I think elements of the way I work here continue like tiling and using similar units of measurement and repetition of patterns. And those are all things I love to do. And then I'm gonna uh, move into showing a lot of examples of my public artwork. And I am such a champion of public art. I love public art, I work in public art and I'm a public artist. And I think it's uh, one of the last places there's public money to fund artists. So it's why I always steer people there and champion it so hard. So my introduction to pub public art was via um, a residency on the Fremont Bridge that I got in 2009. And for three months, I got the only key to one of the vacant bridge towers on the Fremont Bridge. and I. I got to use that as my studio and I got to pitch an idea for what a temporary public artwork would be from that experience. And I was so taken by all the sounds of the bridge, the, how the boats communicate with the bridge tower operators, the honking cars, the bicycles and ducks. And it was just a very loud environment. And in addition to being loud, I had some people sharing stories with me about how meaningful this bridge was in their life. They had 
proposed to their wife there. They had fallen in love there. They had all, all, all kinds of things like that. So I collected a lot of oral histories, worked with a sound artist, much smarter than me, to create a lyrical composition that we put on this 1-800 number. And then I got to work with um, SDOT, the Department of Transportation, which crazy enough is where I now work, um, to create a series of signs. And we posted them in Fremont and Queen Anne and this sound piece lived for uh, six months. And then here's an image of the sort of opening celebration that I produced for, for this sound piece. Um, I had like hundred volunteers and we were on four corners of the bridge and a friend with a sailboat kept doing like a kind of donuts through like union to keep the bridge opening and closing for three hours. And we just kind of celebrated this piece of city infrastructure. Fast, fast forward to now, I now work for um, Office of Arts and Culture and SDOT, and we have continued this residency on the Fremont Bridge. It kind of went dormant for a while, and then when I got into that job, I wanted to figure out, you know, how does public art work, and why does why does this not continue? And so it, it we have figured out how to reinvigorate this residency. We've now had a literary artist, Alyssa Washuda, a musician composer, Parl Walsh, uh, and this summer, uh, Roger Fernandez, a, a graphic novelist in the bridge. So that, I'm excited as an arts administrator to see this continue. So then I'm gonna go into showing some kind of murals and large scale stuff like that. So around the same time I was on the Fremont Bridge, I got a commission also through the Office of Arts and Culture to, this is a fun temporary gallery. It doesn't, this program doesn't exist anymore, but a number of artists were selected to scale up their small scale works to large printed vinyl that was stretched across the building. So it was so cool to start with the small painting scale it up to like whatever this is 120 feet wide and see that on the building for a few months this is the now the four the, this is the construction of the four seasons hotel I remember at the time i did this thinking like see how it's changing so fast and you know now that's laughable because it's just changed even more um but what's cool about this program is that the these vinyl banners came down after their life and then that turned into tote bags so that was, that was kind of fun uh second life for the project um, and then I started getting more into murals. And this is a mural I did for Sound Transit when the Capitol Hill Link Light Rail was under construction. And I was actually interested in something I've remained interested in, kind of like breaking the fourth wall. Like how do you get your audience to actually touch and interact with your artwork? And so I created this blank plus blank equals thumbs up or thumbs down equation. This is like Facebook was kind of just starting out and the thumbs up, thumbs down thing was kind of just entering our lexicon. Uh, so I worked with um, students of mine, I was teaching at Cornish at the time, and um, they helped me create these moving parts. So you could spin these dials and say something like, uh, you know, pioneer spirit plus uh, boombox equals thumbs up. Um, so just a fun exercise. Uh, this again was temporary. Um, then we're seeing here what is kind of my biggest project to date in 2014. I was awarded a commission through Four Culture and King County Regional Parks to transform a tunnel in Bothell. This is on the Burke Gilman Trail. The tunnel bit, um, hit with a lot of graffiti. It was kind of dark and, you know, it was just like drab infrastructure. And, and it was an invitation to an artist to change it. Um, I decided that if I was gonna change it, like the whole thing should be changed, including the ceiling. So that was a huge undertaking uh, for me. I had to employ a lot of people and volunteers and took two weeks to paint. Um, but I was, it was so fun to just respond to the architecture, to the architectural lines and just create this like kaleidoscopic uh, moving mural. Um, so then I guess that be led to me becoming this like tunnel muralist. <laughs> Uh, I have an old friend that once joked that um, I'm creating the opposite of phallic symbols by painting tunnels. I don't know, I'm a female artist, maybe that's a thing. So last summer I was awarded a commission by the city of Boise to paint uh, this, these retaining walls and tunnel on their green belt. They have a kind of like a Burke Gilman Trail um, green belt that runs right through the center of town and really heavily trafficked. Um, it's right along the river. And uh, so it was really fun. I just kind of took a modernist approach, wanted to just like really activate it with color. And inside there's text that reads, go with the flow. Because again, this tunnel, this whole structure is right next to the river and people are flowing through it all the time. And then what was fun was to employ a bunch of Boise artists. So I thought this is a giant undertaking. I could 
like uproot my life and go live in Boise for the however many weeks it would take me to paint it. But it would be more interesting to take this not huge budget, but reasonable budget and actually give it back to the local arts ecosystem. So I hired six Boise artists and we all worked together for a week and it was uh, really fun. And it's been fun to just stay in touch with them and kind of understand how different city artists in different cities kind of what they experience. This image was in that video. It's a mural I painted for the United Way in downtown Portland. Oregon and the United Way uh, wanted to convey their mission vision statement of unity across seven different languages that they, you know, that match their demographics that they serve. And so I called on uh, textile examples from these different cultures to create this mural in downtown Portland. Um, then smaller scale stuff. This is in my backyard here on Beacon Hill in Seattle. I am really lucky to be part of an intentional community. There are four houses. We all share a backyard. We really share our lives quite a bit. And um, the, this pavilion, we, in the summer months, in the nice months, we eat under here a lot and gather under here a lot. And uh, there's just a big brown wall. And so this is kind of a collective uh, paint by numbers. Like I outlined it, we all kind of helped paint and used a lot of tape for all these stripes. And um, anyway, the message is simple. And then here is just an example of me, again, kind of playing with architecture. This is a friend's kitchen knockout that she wanted painted. So it was just sort of a project for a friend, but I was interested in um, movement and lines and following the lines of the building and playing with different colors and how they behave together, which is something I always love doing. And then you can see that kind of scaling up to this really large building on the Soto track here in Seattle. And for those who don't know, you know, we've got 60 plus artists from around the world uh, with murals on this transit corridor. And it's just so cool. I just love this part of Seattle. I felt lucky to be one of the local muralists asked to do a painting here, a mural here. Uh, and I really was interested in, again, just responding to the lines of, you know, the shingles on this building is all shingled and then the lines of the roof. And so we snapped lines with chalk, uh, like construction chalk, um, to, to mimic those lines. It was crazy on boom lifts, crazy amount of work. And um, the colors that thematically the artists were meant to respond to ideas of uh, movement, motion, progression. And I wanted to use colors that were kind of evocative, like highway colors and signalization and that kind of thing. Uh, this is a mural inside that I painted for the Museum of Museums, or MOM, uh, which is an amazing space that had kind of a soft opening in October, and unfortunately with COVID, I think is now shut down. Uh, but this is like three stories of all these immersive installations of um, our local artists. And so I was invited, oops, sorry, to paint a mural there. Um, and so again, playing with pattern, line, color, and then there's some text in there. Everybody love everybody. And then sometimes public art takes you to kind of, you know, boring infrastructure. And probably most of us have seen these traffic control signal boxes get transformed with art, sometimes with paint, sometimes with vinyl wraps in the case of these. And so the Soto BIA and Urban Artworks invited me to create five designs for Airport Way in Soto. And these went up hmm, last spring. So lots of different patterns from textiles and quilting and things. And then words that I've taken from historical references to Soto, kind of the history of Soto. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about collaborating. So um, I love collaborating. I love working with other artists and I feel very lucky to have um, Elizabeth Johnson in my life. So Elizabeth Johnson and I met through our work together at the Office of Arts and Culture and uh, share a lot of ideas about public art and what can be and we, I guess I'm showing this in part to show just kind of experimentation and, and fun and making things up for yourself. So Elizabeth and I uh, were kind of bemoaning the hard work of being an arts administrator and managing public art projects for other artists all the time. And like, we should just do something for ourselves. We're also bemoaning the tyranny of Valentine's Day when we did this. And at the time we're both um, divorced, single moms and we're just like, ugh, Valentine's Day. And so we created these flags that are sort of mantras of, of self-love. We call this project Radical Self-Love Seattle. So we performed them, had them photographed um, up on this, you know, inspiration point here in Seattle where people often propose to each other and then uh, use these photographs to ask people to contribute lines of po poetry and then created our own 
love poem for Seattle. And so this was just a made up project that we just like funded ourselves, hired a photographer and just had fun with, but it has, it was a conversion point for Alishba and I, and now Johnson Ramirez have gone on to get a lot of different public art commissions. So here we are uh, months later that same year, um, invited to be part of Bellwether, the art fair in Bellevue. And um, we were asked to create a socially engaged practice artwork that would kind of activate this corridor between the transit center and the mall and the museum. So we set up a table where we had people write notes to strangers. We collected hundreds of them and then put all those notes in balloons that we handed out during the festival. And so you could pop the balloon and get this note of uh, uplifting note, you know, of kindness from a stranger. Maybe not the most environmentally um, nice project, but very fun. Uh, Alishba and I have gone on to do many projects together. This is another project we're working on now for Yesler Terrace. Uh, Yesler Terrace is such an interesting experiment of um, public housing and market rate housing altogether. Um, I have learned that we don't really have any models like this in the United States. So right here, you know, in First Hill downtown Seattle, we have 500 plus units of public housing mixed right in with very expensive market rate private development. And in the public housing, you have so many different languages spoken, so many people from different places. And so we kind of launched this project with a say hello campaign and created these chalk stencils with the word hello across a whole variety of languages. Uh, here, Vietnamese, Mandarin, we use Korean, Spanish, all these different languages. And um, part of it, our charge is to activate the corridors to get people to understand all these new roads and pathways that are in Yesler Terrace. And then that has translated to an ongoing newspaper that we're producing called the Esler Terrace Hello. And it's all content generated by the community that gets printed in these kind of seasonal uh, newspapers. Alishba and I this last year also were hired by uh, Four Culture and King County Metro to create a master art plan for Rapid Ride. So Rapid Ride is expanding throughout King County in massive ways and is gonna produce a lot of 1% for art money. So it'll be a lot of public art projects coming down the pike out of this expansion of Rapid Ride. So we were asked to make this plan. So it was kind of like our public art project manager selves were able to dream up these fun projects, like about 20 of them. And um, the rest stop on the left is a flyer from an event we, gosh, it's exactly one year ago. It was Wednesday, December 11th of last year. We got a special bus and hosted uh, an event on the bus. It was really fun. So we had Daniel Davis doing guided meditation, Jane Wong reading live poetry, and then Eva Walker with the Black Tones doing an acoustic set on the bus. So cool. And then people were filling out surveys about their writer experience and sort of what they like and don't like about the bus. And that really fed into our thinking for the plan. So I'm showing this just to show like community engagement as a huge part of public art uh, for, for everyone and for me, really important. Um, and then here's a shot of a project Alicia and I are doing in the city of Tacoma. They're getting a new um, dedicated like protected bike lane and it's gonna, this mile long corridor has this buffer strip. And so we were hired to kind of bring public art elements to all this new infrastructure. And here we are at a test pour with these uh, custom made stamps um, looking at how the concrete's being transformed in that neighborhood. So that's just fun. Uh, and here's the shot kind of of me on the other side of the table as my arts administrator self, but it's just a project I'm really proud of. So colleagues from and I, from the Office of Arts and Culture in the spring, you know, when COVID hit and we all locked down, we're just like, how do we support artists? How do we pivot in this moment? And public art can be very slow and like, you know, in the molasses of city bureaucracy, but this was a project we did very, very quickly. We hired 10 different um, Seattle artists. You see images here by David Rue, um, Asia Tail worked with a number of indig indigenous artists, Sean Parks, uh, Hugo Morrow. Um, that's Randy Engstrom, director of the Office of Arts and Culture Distributing Signs. And then my partner and my son here with a sign outside of our house um, by the artwork by Haley Tayati, indigenous artist. So um, I was really excited about this project. We got about 2000 of these yard signs put out all across the city uh, very, very quickly. So that was fun. And then I'm going to show um, a couple examples of letterpress printing because I also do that. And this year um, was invited to be the designer in residence at the School of Visual Concepts, which has an amazing letterpress studio. It's been there for a very long time. Um, I did a lot of letterpress when I first moved to Seattle and 
and just like working in so many different materials, I have, haven't always returned to it, but I was invited to rejoin this community and was so excited by that. Unfortunately, SVC has been a casualty of uh, COVID and so they have closed and the letterpress has kind of moved into private studios across the city and a variety of really talented, energized, amazing people are, are still printing. And so this is a locked up press bed on the Vandercook press. Um, so all the, this is all movable type that I set uh, to be the people over and over and it's been inked up in yellow ink. And this became a background for the posters that uh, were part of a collaborative project where we crowdsourced um, statements from people about this crazy year and moment that we're in um, and put out into the world. So there's a version of this living right now at the Ballard branch of the Seattle Public Library. Of oh, sorry, the posters, which you'll see right here. So um, yes, every almost 50 year old woman wants to see her butt in a photograph, but here I am installing all these crowdsourced uh, statements that we printed across five different letterpress studios um, onto these broadsides, these posters that we created. And now I'm just gonna show a few images um, of work I have been playing with. Um, I felt very lucky to be invited to um, be the artist in residence uh, at Amazon, one of four. So uh, Amazon invites four artists per year kind of seasonally to set up a studio and play and tinker in, um, on, the, on the campus. And so I'm one of those four artists this year and I just finished that residency over the summer. Um, and it just felt like such an unusual time to be A, at a place where there are no people going to work, or hardly any people going to work. And then, um, just we're in this poignant moment of you know social unrest and global pandemic and economic fallout and uh, how do you make art at a moment like this so i kind of gave myself permission to just be really quick and playful and i kind of just made like a thing per day that i went there and i started with these pennant flags that they had there already and just started playing with kind of form and color and um i think when i look back on this work i think all of these might be studies for larger public art pieces i would love to do uh, but this is just like kind of afternoon of play here. Oops, why does it want to advance? There we go. So then another series of, I did a whole series of um, flags with sort of action verbs. So again, just um, listening to all the, uh, what's going on around me and what, what, what we're all yelling and all the work that, that needs to be done in this moment um, toward social justice, toward racial equity, toward fixing our economy, all of it. Um, and then I kind of view this, I know this was in the um, video. Uh, I was making these little boxes just because, just for fun. I was thinking kind of about toys and dice and rolling dice and kind of like the magic eight ball. And what if you had uh, maybe like a large scale public artwork that functioned like dice in the landscape um, and you get a different message each time. So I was just thinking about how none of us are really okay, even though we're kind of okay right now. That's what that was about. And then um, because I have the sense of humor of a 13 year old boy, I was thinking about four letter words and how much I like them and how satisfying they are to say and just came up with a whole list of them and made a die of four letter words. And then just to show my working process a little bit, I showed that earlier miniature billboard. And so also at Amazon this summer, I played a bit with um, again, this sort of like low stakes architecture. So building these forms out of balsa and glue and illustration board and not much else. Um, and again, I've been just collecting like all the things that I write down from things that enrage me that I read or, uh, you know, just sort of quips and, and things that I'm thinking about. Um, and then created this sort of like community of, you know, pissed off billboards. Um, and so I could, these are very small and, uh, you know, not meant to be sort of like archival. They're just really like little studies. And I can imagine, I'd, I would just love to see these like bigger in the landscape. Um, and then just another, oops, another just sort of playful thing here. Um, I was thinking about how I make murals, how I make work and how I like to work in modular ways. And it would be interesting to make a modular mural. So these are two different images. So I had these 12 by 12 
plywood panels and painted this, you know, circle form on them, played with different colors, and then started moving them around and actually made a time lapse animation just to, to watch it change. Um, so who knows where this will go? This is just sort of a little playful experiment. All right. So I am going to go into now like the making cooking part of the show today and uh, walk you through um, a little project. So just some slides to show. I, um, I guess I showed a lot of ways I love to just play in the studio and I'm often making these like little ready-mades where I will take a found object. So in this case, drift, driftwood that I found on the beach and play with color and form and pattern just because, just because, just, just for fun. And um, so we're gonna do a little something like that today. So here I am using enamel paint, one shot enamel I love using on driftwood. And here I am playing with rocks I've been collecting from the beach, same, just enamel, enamel on, enamel on rock. <laughs> and then just to show some inspiration shots. So um, I, take inspiration from so many places. And I, I like to blur the lines between art, design, craft. I um, am very inspired by textiles. And um, my mom had, when she worked, she's now retired, but had her own business um, sewing interior stuff like window treatments and upholstery and things like that. And taught me how to sew. And um, I've made quite a number of quilts in my life. So I just, I love quilting. And I love that this is a uniquely American expression and uniquely, you know, a woman's expression. It's just another quilt sampler here. So these are endlessly inspiring to me. And like I said, I think I'm always blurring the line between art and design. You know, I love design. I love contemporary art or designy tiles. So there's my dream kitchen there. And then here's just a photograph I took in Mexico City last year, it's endlessly inspired by Mexico. And um, I just love all these forms. So just things like this I collect, you know, become part of what I'm borrowing, stealing, you know, getting inspired by. And then again, like textiles, textiles, Mexican textiles are endlessly, uh, to me, just some of the most beautiful art that I could see in the way colors are combined in these like audacious ways I love. Um, and then in the capital A art world, you know, of course I'm endlessly inspired and I miss seeing art so much right now um, as part of the invitation to be here today. I got to go to the City of Tomorrow show at the SAM and it was so invigorating to be in person at the museum after all these months of being on lockdown. Um, but again, in the interest of, of uh, championing women artists, this is Carmen Herrera, who I think is among the most talented uh, of these modernist painters you know, right there with Ellsworth Kelly and Frank Stella and others. And so Cuban, Cuban um, artist, Carmen Herrera, these are her works. Um, Saul Lewitt, I take endless inspiration from. My son's name is Saul in part because I love the work of Saul Lewitt and uh, was actually supposed to go to Mass Mocha this year to visit his work um, at that museum and didn't get to go. But um, uh, just absolutely love how, how he thought about work and made work. And then this is uh, kind of weird to show, but this is, I just took with my phone at the City of Tomorrow exhibit. And this is the work of Frank Stella. And I love color. Color is my drug. I think, you know, people often call out that I use color as a true kind of like Californian, but color just really makes me feel good. So I was so interested in looking at this Frank Stella and how these, you know, sort of like jarring pink and orange come together and how it makes your eyes vibrate. Um, and so I'm always thinking about that when I'm making work and I thought I'd just show this detail for that reason. So then my teacher self, I taught um, foundations at Cornish College for many, many years. And we, you know, we always talk about color theory and I don't really think about this in a formal way anymore but it's just so in my brain and my body, I guess. So I tend to work, so this is the color wheel and I tend to gravitate toward colors on the warm side of the wheel. Maybe that's because we live in like the cool side of the wheel here in Seattle. So I'm always trying to warm up as a Californian. Uh, and so those tend to be the colors I work with. I'm also a big fan of just limiting your palette. It, it gives you less choices and like more freedom in the end. Um, and then here I'm just showing how complementary colors really do something extraordinary. So I love thinking about colors on opposite sides of the wheel and how they behave together. 
so sometimes people ask me, you know, how how to how I choose colors or how they ought to choose colors. And I do think that the complementary colors to me just always do something magical. And then um, like in the mural I just painted at Amazon, I don't actually use that many colors at all. I'll, I'll buy like three paint, three colors of paint at Sherwin Williams or wherever, and then add white to them. And so working in this monochromatic way. Uh, getting tints and tones and shades of the same color. Um, I really enjoy doing that too. So just kind of revealing some of how I'm thinking. And then this is this thing. We're gonna, I'm just gonna walk you through how I made this little painting on a piece of scrap piece of two by four. Um, this is gonna be the demonstration that I'm gonna do right now. And so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and just walk through the making of a little art object. All right. Linda, am I good to keep going? Yeah, you are good. I just, I personally have one question and, um, and I know that that, you know, that deck of images was from decades of work, but I'm just sitting here trying to wrap my head around how um, you do all that work and our mother and work for money. And, you know, so like, do you have a secret about your studio practice that um, like, are you very disciplined around it? Or how do you, how do you manage all of that and um, still, you know, successfully make artwork every day? <laughs> well, I don't make it every day. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, so yeah, when I do, so, when I look back at that, I'm like, God, I have been busy, wow. Um, I think, uh, well, okay, so the the transition I made from kind of the studio to more public work was a very practical matter, actually, and it had everything to do with becoming a mom. And so, you know, I trained as a printmaker at the at UW and kind of maybe thought about being a gallery artist, but I just couldn't figure out how to find time to like just tinker in the studio and make things and hope they would sell in a gallery or that kind of thing. And not to be mercenary, but everything costs money and it costs money to make art. And around the time I was pregnant, actually, I was invited to paint my first mural. And it, it was on the Soto track, it's now painted over, but I was like, oh, wait, you're gonna pay me this amount of money and it's exactly these dates. And I knew that I would have a small baby at the time, but I was like, oh, well, with that amount of money, I could pay for daycare on these days and I could go paint this mural and like create this giant gesture um, without sacrificing, you know, my baby or the that time that I, it's, it's weird to say that it was a practical thing, but it, it kind of was in a way. And public art for me is it's paid work. It's known quantities, they're known deliverables, you know when the work is gonna happen. And I've been able to just like build and engineer a schedule around these deadlines. And so for me, that's part of, of what I like about the public work. I also, um, and it's not to say the gallery system is not, you know, for people, but that, that's just not what I have pursued. And um, I also, you know, embarrassingly maybe work very, very fast. I work very quickly and I find as I get older, I can work faster just because I know how to do things now and um, just give myself permission to work quickly and make mistakes and not be too precious about things. So I guess that's, that's a partial answer. So much longer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's great. That's great. Yeah. Uh, cool. Well, let's move into making. We have about 15 minutes. So. Oh, wow. I talked a lot. Okay. So I'm going to tilt my camera down and show y'all this back, my kitchen table. And um, like you saw in that still photo, um, I created a thing. This one has like a little more, a few more stripes on it. But I did this um, with just scrap two by fours that I had in our side yard after this little construction project. And um, so I'm doing like Julia Child's cooking style here. Like this is finished, lasagna. And here's like the parts we're gonna make and then kind of in between. So I think um, this can be done with any kind of ready-made thing. So this is like scrap two by fours. Like this still has the stamp on it. Uh, it could be rocks, it could be fabric, it could be paper, it could be anything like that. I actually like a big nerd and wearing um, a jacket that I painted do, 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 about a year ago. And I painted it in the, using all these same principles that I'm going to show right now. So I'm basically showing like how to create a grid and then give yourself like some coloring to do, some work to do. So um, I 
am not precious about materials. I, like I think I said, tend to buy a lot of materials like at the paint store and not as much at the art supply store. So you could use anything. I mean, this could be just like a big pen and um, crayons and paper, uh, colored pencils, whatever. I'm using acrylic paint right now. Uh, acrylic paint is awesome because it's basically like liquid plastic, pretty easy to use. Um, and then I'm working small, but this is really the same way I think and work when I'm making a mural. So you can think about scaling up these same methods. So I like to create a grid um, that and use kind of units of measurement, um, play with the color, and then you can scale up the same way of working from this size to much bigger. You're just going from like a very small little ruler to a yardstick or um, that kind of thing. My, again, my tools are very simple. The ruler can become a yardstick. I use a level a lot. Um, that Amazon mural you, you saw, I was using the actual pin with string to make those circles. Um, I'm measuring constantly, I'm doing math constantly. Um, I also have done murals where I'm making giant stencils and bringing them on site or occasionally projecting things and tracing, but more often than not, I'm just scaling up from, from a grid. Um, so I'm just gonna show how I got this grid on here. I have this little two by four. I was like, well, let's see, it's three inches wide. So let's just let's just make three lines that are each an inch wide. So I just tick off um, in a couple places to get a straight line where those inches fall. Conveniently, this little paper ruler is exactly one inch. So I'm gonna just put it flush with the bottom of this board and then trace this line. Like so. Do the same thing on this side. And then, um, and then I just kind of made arbitrary choices about like a variety of widths of these other stripes going the other direction, but they're all units of measurement. So they're all either like a quarter, half or a full inch. So then I just went down and was like, okay, let's do half an inch, half an inch, half an inch. And then we're gonna go up to two inches, and then we're gonna go down to one inch, half an inch, half an inch. Let's do another two, one, one. These are half inch. And then I got tiny here and did a quarter, quarter, and then an inch. And then I connect all these lines. I won't bore you with all of this, but anyhow, this is how I got the grid onto this two by four. So then, Chris, did yeah. you prime that wood or no? It looks a little I, white. But. I didn't. I didn't. You could. You could. You absolutely could prime it, but I have not. No, I'm very not precious about any of this. Um, so then you have your grid, and then you basically created like, you know, like a coloring page for yourself. I think at the end of the day, I just love coloring. <laughs> so then I'm going to jump to like stage two. You can see here I've already done the orange. Orange is my favorite color. So I tend to always start with orange and tend to use orange in everything I make. Um, I just want to be washed in orange all the time. Um, and a tip would be, and this is actually kind of comes from printmaking. I like to start with the lightest colors and then work up to the darkest colors. And in printmaking, the darkest color is usually black and it's called the key block. And like in an exercise like this, you can kind of think of it the same way. So. Um, I started with orange and you can see that I actually kind of like went over the lines. So I'm kind of locking them in. And in this case, I actually use a paint pen, this little Polska paint pen and just choo doo do, you know, just spelled out these squares. And again, went like just a little bit over the line. Um, at this point, I would go to the next color. I think next I did pink, the light fuchsia. And then I'm going to show you know, again, I'm old at this point. I've painted like a million walls and houses and things in my life. So I can cut a straight line pretty readily. I don't use tape when I'm painting my murals, but um, tape is your friend. Tape was a great tool, um, blue painter's tape. So I'll show how to do that. But I also just really love like a really square brush. And so this brush happens to be exactly one half of an inch. So it's like exactly this dimension and just makes it really easy to keep straight line. But if you want to use tape, of course, like no shame in tape at all. I'm just, tape is expensive and I'm cheap. And anyway, so let's say I'm moving from orange to pink. And let's say I want to make this square pink. 
you know, again, the orange went a little bit over the line. So I'm going to tape just to that line on all sides. Like so. And, and that's it. So you have this nice contained space for the paint, like a couple other tips. Um, tape is great, but it doesn't totally stop the feathering from happening. Um, but one hot tip for stopping the feathering is to use whatever the base color is. I mean, you would ask me if I primed, I didn't, but if this were primed, you could take that same primer and just hit the edges of this tape, just give it like a little bit of time to dry. And then when you go back in with the color, uh, and then when you remove that tape, you're going to get a super crisp line. So just to show the example, I'm just going to use the orange in this case, because it's already coming up here and just kind of lock in these lines. This is a paint pen, so it's going to dry really fast, but I would like let that dry. Um, hair dryer, it's a great tool. And then once that's dry, I'm ready to hit that with my paint. Um, I have here my ancient, like guilty of never, I, I probably haven't cleaned this palette in 10 years. I don't know, I just keep using the same palette. But in the case of the pink and the dark pink on, on this little thing, I was using a Daniel Smith quinacridone magenta and mixed it with some white. And um, so if I'm making the pink, I'm just gonna do both of these at the same time because they'll stay fresh for a little bit. I had the dark pink there and then here, I'm making the lighter. So there's that and add a little bit of white. Probably too much white, we'll see. Kristen, do you consider this kind of style of working like a maquette or something for a bigger, do you do, is this your part of your process when you're yeah. something like yeah, Probably, I don't even know if I say that to myself, I'm just kind of having fun, but um, I can look back on it and be like, yeah, it's probably, yeah, yeah. Like it's a study for something bigger. Just kind of a fun little exercise. Then I have some water in the jar, paper towel. I didn't, I, I'm at my kitchen table and I didn't put anything down. I probably should have put newspaper or something, but I didn't do that. So then I'm just gonna mix this pink. Again, I'm, I'm moving fast. I would probably be a little bit slower about this. Um, I'm just moving quickly right now. It's a little bit lighter than I want it, but that's fine. And then um, just to show how this works, um, you know, I locked in with the orange and so now I'm gonna go over with the pink. I'm gonna start from the tape and go in because if you go out into the tape, sometimes it wants to kind of feather. Look at that, it's on my table. So yeah, and then once that dries, then you just pull this off and you have a really crisp line. Like so. And yeah, so for this, I just kind of, you know, kept building it up till I got to the darkest color, the turquoise. Um, I got, you know, fancy with the, with more striping over the top. I just kind of mimics like a textile pattern. I was thinking of uh, Annie Albers, the German Bauhaus textile artist, but I used a paint pen to then get all these other little stripes in there. But, you know, you could do anything with this. You could just like individually stripe with a pen or there's anything that could happen here. So it was just a play playful little experiment there. I love it. It looks really fun. I mean, it just takes a little block of wood and then now you have a piece that you can, yeah. you know, it's not super precious, but it's like really fun and beautiful. Yeah. So someone, someone will get a weird Christmas present this year. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, God, thank you so much. That was so amazing. I really, uh, really enjoyed it. And I think our panel or uh, participants did as well. We have a lot of nice comments in the chat. Um, everybody's loving it. Um, I guess I just want to close um, with just appreciation, thanking you so much. Oh, there is something here. Hang on. So, um, something like I can see that the Bothell Tunnel. Do you use a three D? Yeah, model? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually did for the Bothell Tunnel because I had to present and have that approved um, by an advisory, you know, the Public Art Advisory Commission of for Culture. I had it um, produced in SketchUp. So I worked from a, I did it all on paper and then scanned that into SketchUp so that they could have the experience of like moving through that tunnel and what it would do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, um, what's next for you? Do you... Um... Do you have, I mean, I know, no, I mean, it's such a weird world right now. Well, um, I have a lot of different projects going right now. Um, one thing I'm excited about, I mean, there's a lot of things I'm excited about. Elizabeth Johnson and I are doing our first permanent public artwork that is like a sculpture uh, in Burien. That's part of that rapid ride art plan. And so we will be um, creating permanent structure in the right of way like whoa it's like kind of a big deal um in the coming year and so just yesterday we met on site and walked the site and took photos and stuff so uh that's a collaboration with Wishbit Johnson but I'm really excited about that yeah that's great that's really yeah great. yeah all right well thank you so much for your time and for sharing your practice with us it was really really wonderful to have you Thank you for having me. I, I say this all the time. I didn't go into art making to be a public speaker. So I get really, really nervous, but um, it's, it's always fun to, you learn a lot about yourself. Yeah, you were amazing, amazing.